In this video, we're going to be talking about the different groups of the periodic table. Previously, I had mentioned what they were. Uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about them and their properties. So for the first one, we've got group one elements. They are going to be from lithium straight down. They are the alkaline metals. They are the most reactive on the periodic table. What that means is when you put lithium in water, it'll spark and fizz and maybe catch on fire. And when you put francium in water, it'll explode like a bomb. And so they react violently with water, and the further down you go, the more violent they get. Um, because of that, you will never find them in nature as pure compounds. This is actually true for group one and group two, so we'll kind of link them together right now. Group two are called the alkaline earth metals. They're the second most reactive. They start from BE straight down. And again, BE is the least reactive. You put it in water, it might fizz a little and uh, um, all the way down to RA, it might catch on fire. So one good way to uh, explain the difference is the most reactive metal in group two is basically the least reactive metal in group one. Uh, and so they, they, they're still very reactive because normally metals don't do that when they touch water. They just kind of sit there and rust over many, many years. These things will react instantaneously, um, but they're nothing like group two is still nothing like group one. But because of that, you never find them in nature as pure metals. Turns out you can find a lot of different um, metals in nature, or at least quite a few, in their pure form. Like you can find pure gold, pure copper, pure silver, pure platinum, and lots of other metals that are pure or near pure state um, in, uh, in nature. These guys, since it's impossible to escape water, even in the desert, it does rain every once in a while. And if you're talking about elements that have been in the ground for you know hundreds of millions, if not billions of years, then they've come in contact with water and they've formed compounds. So you're never gonna find them pure. You purify them by a process called electrolysis. Um, and these guys react with HCl to form H2. Right now, these are just factoids at this point. Later on in the year, when we learn a little bit more, we'll actually be able to do these reactions. These are called single replacement reactions. And what they do is they show when you take sodium, in, which is a group one metal, and you add HCl, the H comes off, the Na goes in, and you end up getting hydrogen gas and then the sodium with the chlorine. Uh, and so the same goes for group two metals. They do the same thing, but they do it in a slightly different way. Um, since they happen to be plus two, you should know this at this point, um, they're plus two, so when they react with chlorine to form an ionic compound, it's a plus two and a minus one that's being crisscrossed. When NaCl do them, uh, does it, it's a plus one with a Cl minus that gets the crisscross. And so uh, it's a little different. Don't worry if you don't understand the actual reaction. We'll come back to that later. But here's what you do need to understand. Since every element in group one happens to be a plus one oxidation state, when they react with chlorine, they're going to form, a, since chlorine's always negative one, they're going to form a one-to-one -one ratio. So instead of saying Na, I could write XCl, where X can be any element in group one because they all have the same oxidation state, so they all form the same general compound. Group two, they're done the same way, except since they are all plus two, they're going to form XCl2, all right, because it's a plus two and a minus one crisscrossing every time. The same goes for oxygen. When group one combined with oxygen, since they're always plus one and oxygen is always negative two, they're going to form a general formula X2O, X being anything in group one from sodium down. And then the reverse is true for MgNO uh, when group twos react with oxygen. Since group twos are all plus two and oxygen's always negative two, then they're always going to reduce and they're always going to form a general formula XO, X being any metal on group two. Okay, so the general formula part you should understand because we've done crisscross a lot at this point, and so that should make sense to you. Uh, now the next two groups, uh, we'll do, you can do them one at a time because they don't really have as much in common. Groups uh, 3 through 12 and some extra which are kind of like under the staircase, uh, they're called transition metals. They are also called, sometimes called heavy metals. They, their claim to fame is they make colored compounds. So when you have a transition metal in a compound and you have water present in that compound, it doesn't have to be liquid water. It could be water that we can't, that like it would look like it was dry to us, but at the molecular level, there is water present. Um, you get what's called a hydrate and those compounds tend to be colored. 
and their color can um, change depending on the oxidation state of the transition metal. The most, cop the most common example, copper, when it's in the plus one state in a compound with water present, is green, like the, stat the outside of the Statue of Liberty. And copper, when it's plus in the plus two oxidation state with water present, it tends to be blue. And it makes these interesting blue crystals, which are super deadly, which we will eventually use at some point this year, hopefully. Uh, and so... That's the difference. This thing is commonly used in paint, maybe not modern paints as much, but the, definitely the older paints, they use these because they didn't know any better. And the one thing to remember is if the H2O gets boiled away or heated off in some way, you can evaporate H2O, right? If you lose the water, you lose the color. So that's the important part to know about them. Noble gases, we already know these guys, but we'll go over it one more time. They are all stable because they have complete octets, therefore they don't react. Uh, the exception is F and KR, uh, well, or I should say the exception, is that KR and XE have been forced to react with F under very special circumstances. So when you look at the periodic table for these, you're going to notice that KR, they normally all have an oxidation state of zero because they don't react, except KR and except FE. They actually have oxidation states because they've been forced to react under very special circumstances. It does not happen in nature ever. It will only happen in a lab, and the molecules are not stable. The moment you um, remove the conditions necessary, necessary to cause it, the bonds break and they go back to being noble again. So um, that is something to remember, and the, the clue is in the oxidation state, so that shouldn't be uh, too big a deal. So that is the last, or the four of the groups, and then we've got two more. We've got the halogens, and we've got semi-metals or metalloids. So the halogens are Brinkelhoff, so those are the ones that are naturally diatomic, or I shouldn't say that. All of the halogens are in Brinkelhoff, is a better way of saying it. Some of Brinkelhoff are not, in fact, halogens. Obviously, um, hydrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, the last three, uh, well, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, are not in group 17, and so they're not part of the halogens, but they are, in fact, diatomic. So just be aware of that. Uh, there, the thing you need to really know about them is as they, as you go down the group, you increase the number of protons and electrons, you increase the number of inter, the strength of the intermolecular forces, it causes the molecules to attract harder, therefore they get closer together, and it eventually causes phase change. And that's why these two are gases, this one's a liquid, and this one's a solid, because the intermolecular forces get stronger, the molecules attract and get closer, and eventually it causes them to change their phase. That is is something you definitely have to know. The last one, metalloids, or semi-metals, you can call them either one. They have the characteristics of both metals and non-metals. They're used in computer chips, everything on the staircase except Alpo, and this is just a side note. Turns out that their metal and non-metal characteristics usually depend on their temperature. So typically when they're hot, they act more like a metal. And, um, actually, I think it's when they're cold, they act more like a metal, and when they're warm or hot, they act more like a non-metal, but that's not really a rule. Some don't play that game, but some do. So they can be temperature dependent, but that part you don't really need to know.